Köszöntöm érzéket, szervusztok! A következőkben vendégem Krisztián Mungiu, román filmrendező lesz. Az Aranypálam díjas rendező új filmje Eremen címmel nyit hamarosan a mozikban. Február 16-ától látható nem csak Budapest, hanem országosan is a Cirko film forgalmazásában. Mungiu új filmjében egy Hargita megyei faluba viszel bennünket, megtörtént eseményeken alapul a filmje, amelyben hamar elszabadulnak az indulatok, azt követően, hogy a helyi pékség nem fehér helyi munkásokat vesz fel állományba. Hogy pontosan hogyan reagál erre a közösség, hogyan küzd meg ezzel a közösség, egyáltalán miért jelent problémát egy alapvetően multietnikus közösségben ez a helyzet, most mindez elég érzékenyen kiderül a filmből. Tartsatok velünk, iratkozzatok fel a csatornára, ha még nem tettétek volna meg, illetve ha lehetőségetek van, akkor kérlek, hogy szálljatok be a finanszírozásunkba, a leírásban található elérhetőségeken és linkeken keresztül kezdünk. Hello, Mr. Munjiu. Thank you very much for accepting this interview request. Thank you. So, um, before you studied making films, mm-hmm. you were a journalist. Yes. What is the experiences of becoming a journalist or being a journalist, which you can use right now when you are making scripts based on contemporary news? First of all, um, from that period, I... Um, <coughs> I got this habit of reading a lot of news and I very often find a lot of topics which I find to be very interesting. Some of them are just interesting for the press, but some of them are translatable sometimes into films. And what what matters for me is not to to find topics that I would reenact in cinema, but to understand what are the main worries that people have today, what are the main topics that pre- preoccupy them, and what could be the meaning of some something that happened and that I that I read in the news. And I think that from my films, at least two or three, start from things that I've read in the press. And then I did some documentary, documentation, let's say. But finally, what matters is that a lot of the um, of the things that that happen have a a more important meaning for people because they were true and they speak about the nowadays society than things that you could invent. And from this perspective, I'm uh, really spending a lot of time trying to understand uh, what are the worries that people have today. I assume you are working together with professional actors and non-professional actors in your last feature. What Uh, is the selection criteria for the non-professionals? Well, actually, it's very simple. If I can find a professional actor, I will always work with him. Okay. <laughs> Because it's easier. Uh, I have this uh, particular way of shooting, of staging the situations, which is that I'm only trying to use one shot for for each situation. And therefore, I can, I don't know, I can end up by having very, very long shots. And this is difficult for one professionals because the level of precision is you know very 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 precise and very high but for example for this last film i had to use unprofessionals because i couldn't find actors of that ethnicity or of that age we shot this at the end of covid so it was quite complicated with flying uh, but at the end i i don't work very very differently with them the only thing which which differs is that for actors the dialogue is always very precisely scripted. Mm-hmm. While for the non-professionals, they understand a little bit what the situation is, they understand where I need to go, but there's some freedom which you need to allow because they cannot repeat the same thing convincingly very many times, but they bring some freshness. And even for this film, I think that some of the the scenes which were um, very rewarding for the professional actors were the scenes with non-professionals where they had to accommodate even the reactions which are a bit unexpected whenever you work with somebody who is not an actor. There are several issues in your last feature, and one of the most important ones for me is that on one hand there is a so-called peaceful coexistence among Hungarians, Romanians and Germans in the village, uh, where the entire feature is uh, playing, but there is a striking lack of the Roma community, and it is a very important reference from many of your protagonists. How do you see in general uh, the possibilities of uh, getting ahead of Roma people in contemporary Romania? That, that's a very delicate issue. To be honest, I, um, I started by screening this film in a tour, in a caravan, right after Cannes. So I was in a lot of small communities in Transylvania. 
How many committees did you visit, may I ask? Uh, in, I think in 30 days I've been to some 20 places. 20 places? I started um, with a screening precisely in the venue where the original incident happened, in the same village and in the same venue, hmm. this communal house. Uh, it was kind, kind of a sociological, if you want, experiment. It was very interesting to ask these people who of you who are spectators today of this thing inspired locally were here when you know this really happened and there were some a few people saying yeah I, I was here as well so i really wanted to start there because i wanted to make sure that i don't judge anybody for what happened and i'm not talking about them about these people it's just a story inspired by what happened but a story speaking about some other more important values. I just try to depict the complexity of a context in which some people make some choices. What matters for me is to present this as objective as I can from all the points of view and then to allow you to judge as a spectator. Eventually, I don't know, bringing your own point of view and understanding that what matters from, 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 a, from a film is that after you've watched it and ideally enjoyed the thrills of it, maybe you think a little bit about it and see if there is any resemblance with your life. And from this perspective, in these towns where I've been screening the film, we had this conversation all the time at the end about the Roma population. And, you know, everybody agrees what we should all be doing in principle. But yep. between the... the the good beliefs in principle and the reality on the field, there's quite a gap. The problem starts, you know, um, in reality. And we ran across a very strange case in Mirkovacuk, where there's, a, there's an important Hungarian population. Uh, at some point, um, some of the houses in the Roma area burned. Nobody can say how they burned, but let's say they just burned. And the people had to be evacuated. And I was, I was talking there with a, the, with the mayor. So they got all the population and they placed them in the gym and the sports uh, arena of the town. And they stayed there for some weeks and months. It was winter time. The problem started when they wanted to relocate them in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody was um, okay with this idea that they need to be relocated because the sports theater is for sports, but nobody wanted that they are relocated on their own street. Uh, and I think this quite, I don't know, um, talks a little bit about this attitude, which I have to say it's not an attitude which is uh, connected to a specific ethnicity, to be honest. It's a general attitude that some people have on this issue, what we should be doing, we we all know uh, that uh, I don't know some sort of fight against this discrimination should be um, sustained more and with, with more efforts from an earlier age because these stereotypes and cliches that we all use about every other ethnicity starts from a very early age, mm -hmm. and unless you manage to fight this. And to change this in the mind of children from an early age, they, it's very difficult to change it later on. Let's talk about the town hall meeting scene, because I think that's really a directorial masterpiece scene. So it's a one shot, almost more than 50 minutes long. I assume it was written word by word by you. How much time did you take to rehearse the entire scene? Because it's just one shot and there are multiple things going on, even out of the frame of the picture. And it has a very important consequences at the end of the scene. So, so can you expand on your rehearsal method? So first of all, I would start from um, the, the incidents that has inspired this film. And from them, when I was documented, documenting what happened, I could find on the internet the this this town hall meeting yeah the original footage the original yes. so i started for once from watching something that happened of course it was in hungarian so i couldn't understand it but i had somebody translate it for me but when i wrote it of course um, what i could take from it is this kind of imprecision with 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 which people express themselves and this kind of passing from one topic to another and this need of always having an opponent 
somebody who must be guilty for something happening today. But as you can imagine, of course, finally, I need to, I need to write it down. And I wrote it down precisely as a, I think, 26 pages uh, screenplay. And when I got to rehearse it for the first time, I realized that if I want to have the right energy, I need to teach the actors to train them how to speak at the same time with the others, which is something that you don't normally do for a film. Normally you have some actors and one actor says a line, the other one says another line and there's a conflict. But what I did here, I took the first 10 pages and I mingled them with the next 10 pages. So I think that the best recipients for that scene are Hungarians from Transylvania who can understand both languages. Yes. Because actually everybody speaks at the same time and it's up to you to pick up what's more important for you and in which language. But finally, what matters is the feeling that at the end, this if, if this is not reality, it could have been. And very many spectators who do not know how you get to work and to get to such a scene believe that it was recorded on the spot. Uh, and this is because um, we did another thing. I did another thing that you normally don't do for a shooting. I allowed for once the extras to express themselves. You know, the extras are always on a set and everybody shouts to them, shut up, the actors are focusing, let them speak. But you know, after we did this for 20 times, I said, well, actually, no, that this time it's not like this. This time you should express what you feel. Of course, it was a mess. I couldn't shoot for, you know, a few takes. But you know, little by little, they learned that for once this collective character that you try to have in the films had uh, a very precise incarnation in themselves. And they started expressing themselves. And by the end of these shooting days, I managed to, you know, for once I was very gestural and I was trying to conduct this scene and give them the right rhythm of the, the atmosphere. And we got to it finally. But to, to answer precisely to what you asked, um, you know, in theater, you have a lot of time to rehearse. In film, you don't. I had two days to make this scene. No kidding. Yeah, I had two days. Just two days from nothing till um, the finalization. We of the met. Scene. We've met once. I brought the actors, um, but when that place looked like the studio, it was quite empty, so that they understand a little bit in advance how complicated this is going to be. And but you know, um, nobody gets it until you try to make it. Yeah. When you try to make it, then you understand how difficult it is. Because, and it was difficult for me as well. I did a lot of long takes in my life, but with two, four actors for five, 10 minutes, there's one thing. With 25 speaking people, 17 minutes, that's something else. But you know what I like about it at the end is that you can watch your own film if you watch every other character, because every other character was given something to do and say. So it's kind of a bubble tower in which uh, sides are changing all the time and, you know, the working class is looking for an enemy. It can be something, somebody of a different ethnicity or religion or a different social class. So it's a lot about these impulses that we have nowadays in society and that I think we always had of needing somebody else who is guilty for something, something happening to us. It's never us. It's always somebody else. And it's always somebody who doesn't necessarily look like us. It, it must be from some other tribe. Because finally, it's a film a lot about our tribal needs and our need to belong to a community and what happens when, you know, people that we don't recognize as being part of our tribe came around. And the first day of shooting was a complete disaster, to be honest. <laughs> I couldn't have not even one good take, so I was a bit scared. Did you ever regret during that day that you made the decision to do it in a one shot? I, I knew from the beginning. I knew from the moment when I wrote, because, um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a little bit of a, not a philosophy, but some ethnical principles behind this decision of shooting things in one, one shot. Okay. It's not just accidental. But, you know, when I started making, films, I thought that I decided that I want to make some films which are inspired by reality and not by cinema. And I, start, I started thinking what, are, what is, you know, what, are, what is the essence of cinema? What can cinema do and no other art can do? 
And I figure out that it's eventually capturing how time passes. In it's a portion of real time in which something happened, but on condition that you don't cut. If you use, use editing, that's a different kind of language. So I decided to adopt this way of thinking and to respect the reality in such a way in which uh, I would never add music on the film because there's no music. The feelings should come from the actors, from what happens. And I started staging the situations in such a way in which um, to allow the spectators to understand that what's on the screen is just a portion of reality. As in life, there are a lot of other things happening right now that we are not uh, witnessing. They are happening at the same time. But what is happening here, it's a continuum, like our lives with all these very small and glorious moments that you need to cross over. Unfortunately, you cannot cut them off. And this is what I'm trying to do in the film, to allow these small little dead moments, everything should be there in the film. It's not just what's important, because then it's you, the director, saying, this is important, I'm going to show this to you, and this other thing, and this is from here, and this is from here. Well, it's a bit more complicated when you try to include everything in just one shot. And you need a lot of choreography. So by the end of the day, uh, the problem was that um, the scene was so long that the actors couldn't have the right rhythm and remember precisely what they had to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very, very friendly with actors all the time. But for once, I stayed with them. I said, look, um, this is the most difficult thing I ever did and the most difficult thing you are ever going to do in film. And they said, yes, but you know, in theater, we need two weeks to stage this. Okay, maybe in theater, but we have two days here. And it was winter, cold, outside, COVID. And I said, I just need one thing. By tomorrow morning, you need to know precisely what you have to do. And the rest I can handle. So, okay, they started having a little bit of an understanding that, you know, the rhythm comes from, and the freedom of an actor comes from knowing precisely what he has to do. And then he's free to express something else on top. And the next day we started to have a, a better rhythm. Then I had this decision of... Well, what made the difference? I'm very interested well, about that. Uh, there are two things. The first thing, it's very basic. The next day they knew the dialogue precisely. Okay, Sorry, so but you know, that film is about very basic things. And you know, I, I, a lot of people ask me, what, what do I ask actors? Uh, first of all, when we meet out, uh, if you know your dialogue and you just deliver it straight without acting, you know, that's the basic of cinema. And then we can talk about... Learn your yeah, lines, dude. Learn your lines and tell them, you know, every other dialogue has its own logic yes. in the way you express it. If you detect that logic, we can work together. If you detect that logic and you can say it every time, more or less in the same way, then you make my life easier. For, for this scene, what was complicated is that... Um, there were a lot of moments when people had to start before somebody else finished saying yes. something else. And that, that requires a lot of rehearsal. And for once, it was difficult for me to remember what I had to say to everybody. Normally, by, when I say stop at the end of a shot, I know precisely what to ask actor. and say, OK, overall, it's good. You need to do this. You need to do this. We take this off. So we have another one, and I'm never shooting another one just like this. I tell people what to do. For these 20 minutes long takes, it was difficult to remember everything. So I had to watch it and to make some notes. And this is why in, in two days' time, I couldn't make more than, I don't know, I think we did 25 takes. And the other difficult thing for an actor is that um, after I started shooting and rehearsing, some of the actors learned that they are going to be on the other side of the camera. Well, it's a bit complicated to focus, to focus on oh. the other side of the camera. So I was always starting with them. Then I built a wall of mirrors at the bottom of, of that um, big hall. So they are present all the time in the shot, at least mentally. They could see themselves over there and the camera could see themselves, if, them even if they were small. And the other thing was that little by little, I started working better with the audience and this helped with, with, the, with the extras, and this helped the actors a lot. As an actor, you are, you expect that everybody will respect your lines. But all of a sudden, uh, everybody was talking so loud in, in, in that crowd that they had to fight to deliver their line in the precise time. 
And that helped them focus differently. And it gave the right energy. And of course, at the end, what you see in the film is not precisely what I shot, because when when you're not using editing on the picture, you have to use a lot of edit on the sound. And you can do this on condition that people say the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. And then I can really take what was best from everybody. And then it became into a, I don't know, a, a small masterpiece from the mixer. I have a French mixer who was given, uh, I don't know, 40 takes of sound from three different sound crews in Romanian, Hungarian, and German, and he's French. I said, okay, you know, uh, we need to come out of it. And we, I think we spent one month only for this to make sure that I listen to everybody, I pick up all the good lines, and there's a mix in which every little other comment adds up to this situation and to this atmosphere that, you know, this is a community that could be that village, that country, but this country as well, and Europe and whatever village, wherever, hopefully. Thank you, Roger. That's very enlightening and interesting as well. Um, so the international debut of your film was at the Cannes Film Festival, and there is this ongoing trend in the past five years that films selected in the official program ending up on Netflix or on other streaming platforms. Your film did not do that. And as far as I know, none of your films ended up on Netflix or other streaming platforms. What is your observation of this new trend? What do you think about the major streaming platforms? Um, well, you know, I think that there's a lot of very good content over there. This is not the problem. The problem is that um, the financing system for cinema was based for years and years on theatrical exploitation. This is how films were made. And now um, the legislation is behind this technological reality in the sense that um, if most of the films end up on Netflix nowadays and Netflix doesn't have the same kind of input on creating these films outside of their system, there's not going to be possible to create films out outside of their system. And inside their system, there's a certain kind of films which are being created. They can, they can be very funny for a Thursday afternoon and you know they like having authors there, but we need to have some diversity and we need to preserve a sort of independent system of financing so that fresh voices and voices who do not depend on any decision from the producer still exist. But do you think that the major streaming platforms are threatening the aesthetical diversity of contemporary cinema? Well, they, they are not that they are threatening, but it's, it's so easy to watch so much content for so little money. And from that content, of course, all the marketing principles would, would, I don't know, tell you that you need to advertise primarily the type of content which is the most popular. So you ask me if my films are on Netflix. They are on Netflix, but you don't know. Because at the end of all this exploitation, 10 years later, my films are on Netflix, everybody could watch them, but they never pop up and come out if you don't uh, type precisely their name, because uh, it's not that kind of content. So it can be um, a very good opportunity on condition that, you know, uh, we manage to have, I would say, the political will to change the legislation, to negotiate with these platforms, to keep what's very good from these platforms, this easiness of access, but at the same time to understand that they haven't replaced yet um, the old traditional system of financing films. But what do you think about the aesthetical consequences? Because I think there is a very mono outcome of Netflix or HBO and so on. So if you just take one frame from any kind of Netflix produced production, you can say, yes, it is financed by Netflix, it's produced by Netflix, it's distributed by Netflix. And I, I, I think it has an impact not just on the imagination of the audience, but also the imagination of the filmmakers as well. Well, it's, it's, it's a difficult moment for cinema if we have to, I mean, if we're serious, it's a very difficult moment for cinema because um, filmmakers don't, they are a bit puzzled. They don't understand which is the direction in which the things go. On one side, it becomes 
easier somehow in some countries to make a film which is produced entirely by one producer with all the money from the beginning. You just make the film and you advance. On the other side, it's true that... You're still struggling with that a lot? Yes, I, I, yes, I, what I do, I'm my own producer, so I finance my movies and, but, you know, I keep making films of two to four million euros to be able to preserve my freedom. That's all I can fundraise without having to involve, I don't know, streaming money or private money. It's just cinema money. And this allows me still to do whatever I think it's right for the film. And, you know, I wouldn't be too harsh on, on, on the platforms. They need to, produ to produce content and some of it is good and the level of production is good. But they don't invest a lot, as you mentioned, in having some sort of diversity. Everything is standardized. And unfortunately, already people have uh, a certain kind of laziness, which you always have of discovering new things. You're tired, you want to make watch a film, you will go for the things that you know. Yeah. This is why they have genres in the American cinemas, and we don't really think in terms of genres. The first time when somebody asked me what genre is the film I want to make, I had no idea. I mean, mm -hmm. just wanted to tell a story. Uh, so there are opportunities, but at the same time, um, there's this big danger that if we allow this taste to be standardized, then there's going to be even less audience for anything else which is different. And we see this happening today. As you probably know, uh, I don't know, all the distribution of what we used to call art house is, if not dead, is like, I don't know, dying. Uh -huh. It's very difficult to not nowadays. And why? Because um, we still want people to come out and watch a film in a cinema, a mm -hmm. film for which they need to pay a lot more than uh, if they watch a film at home on their couch, just changing the channels. Because this system of financing is not yet in place. And uh, the result is that the audience for art house films has dropped significantly. And uh, I think that people will need to be very, very selective about what they, they, they will finance in the next years. But do you follow any major series coming from HBO or Netflix? So for example, there is this huge cheat called Last of Us. Does it interest you on any level? In a certain, yes, in a certain level, yes. I mean, they don't necessarily speak to me right now, but I hope that at some point they might. So as a production company, we got involved more in the last years and we produced more, more as, as executive producers, but we produced several series for HBO. The last one was shot in Hungary, even if we developed it, it's on a Romanian topic, but there is this uh, financial debate here. So it's now in, in Berlin, it's going to be in two weeks time in Berlin. So I'm interested somehow and I'm following the, the trend to see what happens, but it hasn't arrived yet to the kind of level of quality that I need, for example, to be involved as a filmmaker, as a director. Mm -hmm. For now, I'm rather involved as an advisor, as a producer, uh, I read the dialogues, I read the screenplays, I, I have a development lab, I try to help people out. I keep t telling them that, you know, we shouldn't lower the standard too much. We, it's better to take the audience with us and not to deliver them the same thing all the time with different names and different sets. So I think that there are some perspectives. And the perspectives that I'm interested in is of producing things in some, I don't know, local languages that would still have an impact and would be interesting enough for some other people to watch. But the basic condition is that those uh, filmmakers working for these platforms understand that they still need to have a personal voice and uh, not to accommodate the needs of the platform and became standard filmmakers which are replaceable all the time one with the other. But do you think any particular filmmaker has this kind of a freedom to, you know, engage in a discussion with the producers, with the owners of these big companies and negotiating with them that what kind of an aesthetics would be the best solution for that particular film? It's always coming from people having enough notoriety to, I don't know, to have these conversations. I'm sure that if Coppola wants to uh, say, I'm going to do this my way, uh, they will be very happy. 
And probably if Nicolas Winding Leffen, who finished now a series, uh, wants to do something, they will respect his point of view. So the idea so is... should use their authority. They, yeah. they should use their authority because they don't speak just for themselves. They speak for the directors of series and they should try to uh, advocate the expansion of, the, uh, of this um, freedom of creation a little bit more for the others as well. Because this, you know, this this great difference bec between what we do in Europe and the kind of cinema they, that they do in in, in the American uh, on, the, on in the American cinema is that here still the the filmmaker is the author of the film, while there the, the decisions belong to the producer, and you need to understand that given their system of just private money, that's fair. But you know, the platforms are uh, and the series are now somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. They came over here but they try to come over with that system because they finance things. But here, authors things in a different way. And I think that some more freedom needs to be there on condition that, of course, you hire the right uh, filmmakers for the, for the series. There are other trends which I'm interested in, about your opinion. So there are, there's TikTok, there is YouTube. This video will be placed on YouTube as well. Um, and it has a kind of a fake democratic pledge that we are accessible, we are, so there are no struggles for you to get any kind of a content from anywhere, anywhere of the world. Uh, but these contents have very little touch with the daily re reality of these uh, viewers. So for example, I would love RMN to be placed and released, not just in Budapest or outside of Budapest, but in mid time towns, villages as well. But I think those people who are used to YouTube videos and TikTok videos are, so there is an aesthetical barrel uh, in front of them, giving the enough, you know, patience, giving the enough time to be involved in the movie and and watch it. So, what do you think about this kind of a contradiction? That it would be nice that people who are not used to this kind of an aesthetics would see this movie, would watch this movie, but unfortunately, I think this will not reach them. I I know, and I'm I'm very preoccupied by this. Um, for now, you know, the film will reach these people at some point. All these films which need to be released theatrically at the beginning will end up on these platforms after the theatrical release is finished. Uh, problem is that most of the um, spectators who lost the habit of watching a different kind of, of cinematic language in the last 20 years uh, will receive with some difficulty something which differs from what they watch every night. Mm -hmm. But this is very difficult to change because this, this involves, if you want, an intervention um, at an earlier stage in their development as cultural people and exposing them to a different kind of content as well. And like always, we get back to education. For example, if in school by, I don't know, by the age of 16, you have watched the, let's say, 100 more important films in the uh, history of cinema, and you've learned that it started by being without sound and kind of slow, and it developed, and there's a language, you might later on, I don't know, appreciate that some people have personal points of view and you'll have the patience to watch them. If you just watch, Pixar films because your parents put you there in front of the TV from age three so that they can do whatever. And you watch that kind of very, very, very fast rhythm with music playing all over from minute one to the last one and cuts every two seconds. Oh, I don't know, when you turn 16, you, 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 you cannot be converted any longer to it's a beautiful life. Yeah. That's not going to speak to you. So, but, but you are saying that film directors should lobbying at governments to put uh, movie history into the curriculum, just as they do with world literature, for example. Yes, but you know, uh, it happens that we live in this part of Europe where we have a lot of priorities and we have a lot of, you know, politicians to whom it's very difficult to, to express and to, I don't know, to advocate even more important and urgent matters. And as you know, in these countries, the culture is never very popular or the culture which is not connected with ideology, to be honest. Mm. That culture, which is like the official culture, is always going to be supported. This kind of culture, which doesn't have any agenda, is not necessarily very popular among filmmakers. But this effort needs to be done 
by a lot of different institutions. It's not just the filmmakers, because the filmmakers don't have enough power to do this. It's the film festival, it's the film lovers, it's the cinematics, it's the schools, it's the art house the theaters which are still left. All these institutions together with even some, I don't know, smaller TVs and TV chains could invest a little bit into preserving this kind of diversity in cinema. Because, you know, cinema, it's a very ambiguous term, but it doesn't just mean entertainment. Even if it was born from the circus, if you want, and it means entertainment in a certain way, it turned, it developed into a language in which some people can express some ideas only with this language and not with another. But, you know, it's um, as complicated as any educational process. But do you think that artists should cooperate more and engage themselves more into politics in order to get rid of the market and get necessary funds from the states and make the decision makers understandable, understand why it's important to, to, to put more state money into the activities of these kind of uh, aesthetical practices? For example, you know, we invested a lot of time into doing this back home in Romania, I have to say that what, whatever, you know, when, when we, we talk about this uh, so-called Romanian new wave, the result for this is that we invested a lot of time into changing the cinema law, the cinema financing system, and all of a sudden it was possible for some 10, 15 years for a lot of younger people to make their debut in film, and there's still a system that appreciates more or less what you did before and that would give you some chances to continue. And of course, um, there is some sort of European solidarity, if you want. Mm -hmm. And there are always people trying to change the legislation. And for example, there is a regulation about Netflix, because we were talking about this, and not only about them, about streaming platforms. The European Parliament adopted this regulation that they have the obligation to invest a certain part of uh, their revenues in a territory in producing local content which is what the European Parliament could do. That's very good. It's just that this share is, was implemented by, for example, the French Parliament as a 20% share from, you know, whatever they spend in France, while the lobby in Romania was so that we have just 2%. Okay. You know, they have 20% of a big pie and we have 2% of a tiny pie. So uh, yeah. it's not always easy to make this, this, this lobby, but of course it's very important. What's striking as well that there are very few co-productions, co collaborations mm -hmm. among uh, nation states and the directors in Romania and in Hungary. And I think it's very interesting that your film is partly Hungarian because uh, many actors are uh, speaking um, in Hungarian. I think it will be very interesting for the Hungarian audiences in Hungary and in Romania as well. Um, what, how do you see uh, the collaboration among these two states. So what do you think about this situation? Why are we so isolated from each other, despite the fact that we are living next to each other? And still, among the liberal bubbles in Hungary, there are very harsh anti-Romanian sentiment. Um, I mean, even the so-called enlightened people uh, talking about Romanians as, uh, as an, in, in an unacceptable way. So what do you think, you as a filmmaker, or other filmmakers in the region, how can we, how can you start any kind of a collaboration to uh, get rid of this kind of uh, sentiment? Um, first of all, I made this film, and this film was um, well received um, personally, both by the Romanian and the Hungarian community uh, living in Transylvania and in Romania. The whole experience for us was was bigger than the film, and it went on very well, I would say, up to the end. Because once you start to, you, you manage to create this relationship at, um, at the ground level, talking directly to people and uh, letting aside all this uh, political bullshit and all the stereotypes that people use often, it's easier to advance on a common project. Films shouldn't have purposes, but if there's anything connected with this film that I always hope that the spectators will get, is to be aware about themselves and about how they react in situations like this. Because you're, if you're not prepared, you're just going to react like everybody else, and in a very violent way that would surprise you, first of all. For you, as a professional director, does the Hungarian film heritage mean anything in particular? I, I have, um, I have um, a few 
connections here. And as I was saying, we developed this, this, this uh, series last year, which is a co-production between Romania and Hungary. I, uh, there's another film that we're developing now, and I might be producing a Hungarian director, um, primarily because it was difficult for him to find financing here recently. And he just so you're well aware of the situation of the struggling of the struggles of the Hungarian film uh, directors. Of, of course, I, I know quite a number of, of directors, and I'm aware quite in detail of the situation. I was once in a, this project, which was shot in Eastern Europe with several directors, and I, I remained quite close with Cornel Mondrutsko, and we were co-directors for that film. And then a few years ago, because, you know, we do everything back home in Romania, I'm not just a director, but we have a production house and a distribution house and so on. So I distributed Laszlo Nemes's film and I contributed with an actor to his second film, I have to say, because Vlad Ivanov is an actor yep. who started in cinema in one of my films. So I'm always talking to them. I'm, I'm kind of aware of what, what happens. And I didn't know this, this director. I'm not, not sure that he is willing that I pronounce his name or not. So I didn't know if, um, I didn't know him personally, but I had seen a short film of his and it was enough for him to contact me and to tell me, you know, actually it's very difficult for me to make a film today. I said, okay, I'll do whatever I can. So now we try to help him out. Hmm. There's a screenplay in place. Uh, hopefully we'll get some financing for it. So uh, I think it's for the benefit yeah, of everybody nice that show. if we manage to, I don't know, to to understand that as much as, as cinema is concerned, we are, we are closer together than um, all those things that, uh, I don't know, politicians keep telling you that they set you apart. And if, you know, if artists and if people with some sort of education don't act against these stereotypes, who will? So you need to give some sort of example and say, okay, so let's start this conversation on a human level and we'll see that. There aren't so many differences, as people say. I know nothing about the Romanian film scene, and I don't know nothing about the knowledge of uh, Romanian film students, uh, what kind of uh, knowledge they have about the heritage of the f Hungarian films and so on. But I can say with confidence that here in Hungary, even in, in, the, in, the, fac in, in the university faculties, uh, there are very limited films distributed for the students uh, before the transition. So, for example, uh, no... No films prior to the 90s. Um, so I think it would be important because I assume a lot of film students and film professionals will watch this interview with you. Who are your most important, who are, who is the most important director for you from Romania who inspired you uh, and your works? Hmm. Uh, from, from the directors working before the fall of communism, I think it's Lucian Pintilie. Yeah. He started with a very strong film done in 1968 or 69, I think. And that stayed up to the end. It's called The Reenactment, his most important film. And I think that it's a film who influenced not, not only what I did, but it influenced this whole generation of, of filmmakers which emerged in the last 20 years. Because it manage, manages at the same time to be some sort of a realistic film, but with that kind of, um, I don't know, um, abstract equivalent that he needed to have inspired by reality, but that would talk about the society, which was very enclosed by that time of, I don't know, the communist states in the late 60s. But the film is very good because it's still cinema. It's not uh, preachy, it's not too metaphorical, it's not didactical. It has a lot of things which cannot be appreciated uh, from any other standpoint, but from an aesthetical standpoint, it's good cinema. So if there's any film that uh, film students should try to check out, unfortunately, I think the film is uh, also I don't know, on YouTube, but if not, just I don't know, write to me and I'll find the rights and send it to you here. Um, on the other side, I have to say that there's a great uh, Esteem for the Hungarian cinema. I think that one of the most important Romanian film critics wrote a, a book about Ishvan Sabo and that he never wrote a book about a Romanian writer so far, but he wrote this book. And while we were students there and the students even from today, they continue studying a lot of Eastern filmmakers uh -huh. because our feeling by the end of uh, the communism was that 
I don't know, there were um, the, the films coming from Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Poland were somehow stronger than the films that we produced. I don't know if it's a matter of censorship or not, but it was difficult for the Romanian filmmakers. They were struggling to express themselves without a lot of interference from, from the censorship. It's well known that your sister is an internationally acclaimed uh, p political scientist. Um, she is a liberal icon in Romania and in the international field as well. And a lot of female protagonists in your movies are well educated, well informed. Um, they have Western attitude and so on. So I assume that she had an enormous impact on how you perceive your female protagonists. Am I right? <laughs> The, the, that's uh, that's very interesting. I think that she had some impact on what I do now and on my education, but I wouldn't say that it's a, it's it's a direct impact on how I write about my protagonists because uh, she has moved some 15 years ago to Berlin. So unfortunately, we don't spend too much time together. But she had a major role in my decision of becoming a filmmaker, to be oh. honest, and she was the one who um, helped me. Um, follow her at this uh, student's newspaper, which later on brought us into, I don't know, working a little bit in the press. So she had uh, an important influence in, in my development, let's say. Um, but um, later on, when I started writing a lot of female characters, I was always trying to be close to some existing model that I knew either from these, you know, real cases that I was documenting or from people that I knew personally and always trying to be very close to reality and not to have patterns of characters. So um, I, I'm always trying when I finish the screenplay to make sure that none of the characters is, I don't know, flawless or acting too well or too coherent evenly because you know, there's, there's, there's some sort of ambiguity which is connected with reality and it's good to preserve this in the film as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to make sure that none of the characters are fully coherent because uh, that's more, I don't know, a sort of demonstration and not cinema. And including the female characters and including this last character from RMN. Um, hopefully she's, I don't know, complex enough and uh, she has this kind of uh, needs like for affection and these emotions which are not always very rational and like every other character in the film she makes a lot of choices which are not clear from the beginning because i have to say that uh, the degree of ambiguity that um, i wanted to have in this film is um, i don't know generated a sort of, of symbolism that I never meant. But for some people, it's difficult at the end to understand precisely what's with these bears and what happens at the end. Are these bears or are these people? And it, it's important because some of it was um, meant to be there. As long as you want to make a film about, I don't know, human nature and our animalic side, it's important to find a way in which... Um, you show these things and um, all the ideas that you want to pass on are not only on the verbal level because this is why this is a film uh, because some of it needs to be expressed and the most difficult thing for filmmakers is to express abstract ideas through situations and visual things and this is why this film has two different la layers of animals we have a lot of bears uh, talking a lot about this uh, this need of taming, first of all, the animal inside you. And we have a lot of sheep in the film. Mm -hmm. And this speaks also, you know, the sheep is even more complicated because it starts from the lamb and this kind of purity and innocence associated with the child, which is before education and has access to a different level of the world and ends up with something that is very interesting for me, this process in which some people transform themselves at some point when they lose personal opinion into a little element into a herd uh, and they conform to the opinion of the majority and they lose their individuality completely. And I was very interested in trying to study this in the film. And there are some other animals for which 
I uh, had a very important Hungarian input, so to say. People ask me if I was so lucky that these, uh, you know, there's there, there's a fox in the film. Yes. And before the fox is the main character of the scene, it, it just passes over. And people ask me, oh, my God, you were so lucky there was a fox there. Uh, no, of course not. And I worked very well with um, a very good Hungar Hungarian animal trainer. Was kind enough to come and shoot with us over there. So, you know, we were very open to this as well. And uh, we, we learned this, this uh, intermediary language of speaking with other animals. Political correctness is a very important, subtle theme of the entire movie. What kind of words can we use, should we use, in order mm -hmm. to express our experiences or do verbalizing it? And you were very critical in your recent interviews with political correctness and what kind of an impact political correctness has on Romania. Do you think that it is a real threat of abuse? I mean, political correctness, cancel culture in contemporary Romania? Uh, I, I don't refer to much whenever I speak about Romania. I have this feeling that even if the, the, the action is placed there, I, I speak about some trends that I see nowadays pretty much everywhere because, of course, political correctness has, was not born there. It came there way later because it's like a marginal culture. They start from some center and they spread out. And I'm not critical with the principles of political correctness, but with the way in which they are implemented in reality. Because the idea is to try and change deep down profoundly what people believe about certain things and to change the stereotypes and the cliches that we use about these values. But so far, what we managed to do is just to signal to them that it's not correct to say this. And this, this, this doesn't change much. It doesn't change the way people think. And as you can see, uh, whenever they are free to vote, you will see their opinions and they will express this. And then people have this huge surprises by saying, wow, the, the extreme right is coming to power everywhere. But you haven't listened to what these people had to say before hoping that you can change some of their beliefs. You need to listen to them because they have something to express. There's something that doesn't work well, and it doesn't really help if you forbid them to express themselves. You're not changing anything. So um, what the film is trying to advocate is this idea of trying to engage into a real conversation. Mm -hmm. And the conversation starts when you listen to the other before having the conclusion. If you, when we start talking, I know my conclusion already, that's, that's not the conversation. What matters is to change them profoundly. For example, if you go to, uh, I don't know, a, a Nordic country and you listen to the way they express towards uh, women equality or whatever, you will see that this comes genuinely from inside, from some sort of education of tens and tens of years. We still need some time. And I'm not talking about just about Romania. We still need some time in the East, in the South. And why? Because, you know, uh, you cannot blame uh, people from countries which are poorer because this sort of education comes uh, once you managed to get with the whole society to a certain level of, I don't know, welfare. Before this, when people are struggling to survive, there's, there's, there's no generosity and there's no politeness. All these values uh, come up in societies which manage to fix some other problems first. Priorities are always very selfish for everybody. First of all, you need to make sure that you're okay, your family is okay, I don't know, your neighborhood, the people you know, your nation, and then you can be more generous. But we had this delay in development for a lot of historical reasons, and we tried to catch up, but there's a rhythm of the change that you can ask from people. And um, historically, we are moving in the right direction, but on, on a human level, you know, some people need more time. And my very last question, and thank you for your time, really. I appreciate it. So, in Ereman, you show a very ambiguous attitude towards the EU from your character. It's definitely not enthusiastic, but it's definitely not anti-EU. Let's say it's very realistic. So, for example, uh, most of the criticism are coming uh, from the people towards to the liberation of, uh, of labor, labor market and the consequences on the contemporary and uh, Romanian society. And 21 years ago, 
when your first feature came out, Occidente. I know your uh, mixed feelings towards that film, but but it had a very pro-Western attitude, a very, um, let's say, enthusiastic attitude um, in a subtle way, but I think it definitely was pro-enthusiastic. Um, so what changed in the past 20 years to reach this kind of uh, level um, in relationship towards from Romania to the EU? Because I think it's it has some similarity uh, with the general attitude towards uh, the EU from Hungary. It's definitely not anti-EU, but it's very mixed right now. Um, first of all, these these attitudes in the film are, if you want, more quoted. I was trying to see what is the attitude of the people living then, 22 years ago, and what's the attitude of people living now. Of course, some of my attitude is included, but not too much. I try to understand what is the trend. And you can understand why there is this difference because we were all very naive, if you want, when communism collapsed and we had a lot of hopes. And one of the hopes was that our societies were going to change, to change in a very fast rhythm. Uh, if you remember, we used to have these, these very funny ideas in the communist times, uh, they, we were measuring in time, how time do we need to catch back with the, the Westerners. Yep. Of course, you're never going to, to catch back somebody who started being educated 1,000 years ago. So the idea is that people are disappointed today because the level of that change hasn't reached what they expected 25 years ago or 10, 30 years ago when communism collapsed. And it's, it's, you know, this is not black and white. On one side, uh, the best things that happened, and I won't refer to Hungary, but the best things that happened to people in Romania was that we became part of European Union and these people can work somewhere now and earn their living. Uh, at the same time, they are disappointed that they cannot work at home. And there's, you know, there, there's this, this phenomenon of migration in Romania. Uh, got these huge proportions. We lost nearly three to four million <laughs> people living abroad and in this freedom that's just going to be, uh, you know, a territory without population. And this is because, of course, uh, the changes couldn't cope with the expectations. There are improvements, that's clear. And historically speaking, speaking probably we did in all these Eastern countries whatever we could given the situation. But we live on a human scale. On a human scale, it's still disappointing. We wanted, you know, more changes and a better situation so that you don't have to go somewhere else. And there's also something else associated with, with the European Union, both in Hungary and in Romania. This idea that a lot of the ideas are good, valid, and very generous, but the way they are implemented is somehow naive at some point because there's a huge distance between an office where the decisions are taken and what really happens on the field. And on the field, you cannot apply the same measure always for everybody uh, living from, I don't know, Finland to Hungary to Portugal. There are differences. It's like, you know, how people used to advocate this idea of co-production. You ask me, why don't we make more films together? Well, you know, it, it's nice to think about Europe as just one body, but it's, it's, it's not like this. We have a lot of common values and it's very good that we have them borders. We have no, you know, borders. People won't hammer each other in the head for passing from one side to the other. But at the same time, there is a national culture everywhere. There are languages and religions and you need to understand that some things will always remain national as film, as things depending on I don't know, on, on, on verbal uh, expressions. There are a lot of traditions and so on. And um, this is a complicated process, which, and, you know, people making decisions for everybody at the same time should try to match them with the particularities that every other small country or county has in Europe. Mr. Munji, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ez volt a beszélgetésem Krisztián Mungyi Uval, az Eremen című filmet február 16-ától láthatjátok a mozikban, országosan és nem csak Budapesten érdemes megnézni. Mindenképpen iratkozzatok fel a csatornára, ha még nem tettétek volna, meg ha bármilyen kérdésetek vagy kommentetek van az elhangzottakkal kapcsolatban, akkor a hozzászólások között várunk itt a videó alatt. Ha megtettétek, kérlek, hogy szálljatok be a finanszírozásunkba, a leírásban található linkeken keresztül. Én Gulyás Márton voltam Budapestről, kollégáim nevében is köszönöm szépen a figyelmeteket, hamarosan újra találkozunk, addig is ciao!